all right let me make sure i'm live i sometimes mess up the setting so if the audience is just looking at me there are wonderful people waiting backstage i'm just making sure everything is okay it takes a minute sometimes so please bear with me if you're still looking at my silly face it didn't take a minute awesome hey everyone uh, i am super excited to be having chai built on a special hydrogen uh, stove do not try this at home this is done by professionals but i am excited to have the best kaglers as a panel today we'll be debating best practices for training ml models i was counting the medals some of them have teamed up but still regardless our panel together has accumulated 87 gold medals on kaggle competition and they've they've built incredible products at h2o.ai so they they are the real deal and we'll be learning about best practices for different things i'll try to start some debate try to maybe start a fight if i can and along the way i'll show you hydrogen torch which is a no code deep learning tool built by the panel and you'll also see how it is really easy to do these things in that so i know you don't want to hear more of me and i'll start introducing the panel today i'll go in the alphabetical order we have dimitri godev who's the director of data science and product and his highest rank has been five on the competitions leader board uh dimitri thanks for joining us thank you sayam for having me hi everyone awesome i'll i'll keep going in order next we have gebor fordor uh who's a double gm and his highest rank was Four currently he's a principal data scientist. Welcome, Gabor. Hi guys. After that, I I didn't do this on order, but it appears the team hydrogen you might know them from leaderboard is in the next serial order. We have Pascal Fifer, principal data scientist, and he's his best rank was five. I'm sure he'll climb further up with more medals. Thanks for joining us, Pascal. Uh, you're muted. Oh, thank you, Sanya. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Also, this was really hard to convince him, but I I got some help from Philip uh, because Pascal usually doesn't reveal his face, so this is like a special, very special moment for all of us in that regard. Um, after after that, we have the current king on the leaderboard rankings, Philip Singer, who's a dual grandmaster and senior principal data scientist at H2O. Uh, Philip, this is the ninth interview you're doing with me. Thanks for doing another one. Good being here again. Hi, everyone. and finally we have yawin some people might know him as bs i was one of the fortunate ones who've been following him since uh, his highest rank has been 14 and he is a principal data scientist at h2 thanks yeah. for joining us yawin thank you hey everyone so i i have this very important question to start with what's the best seed <laughs> um, not using any seed at all i would say <laughs> just keep it keep it uh unfixed and uh run your experiments you'll see how the range of of all the experiments go and how how your your scores are distributed so you kind of see how stable or unstable your your validation set is and um you could even make make use of binning and test binning by by um running different seeds of of the same model same same routine So um yeah it's kind of makes sense to to not um fix the seed at all i would say but do do you do seed averaging after that or like do the final ensemble once you like figure out what's what's working best yeah exactly like like i said so similar to uh, to ensembling you can do something like binning uh which i which i call the the um average of uh, multiple seats for the same model or same same training routine okay no one else wants to share the special seat so i assume <laughs> i'll let continue regardless um i i know this is like something may, maybe maybe you all are opinionated or maybe all share the same opinion uh but early stopping do you do prefer using it in your experiments yes or no and i i know philip you have a strong opinion so I'll, maybe we can start with you yeah i i i i dislike early stopping a lot so i will never do it maybe sometimes in like light gbm models maybe just to get a feeling but otherwise i would always encourage to optimize the number of epochs across all folds if possible and 
um, because early stopping is 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 leaky in terms of overfitting to the validation data set. But this is just in a nutshell. There is a longer answer to it. But uh, to answer your question, I, I I don't like early stopping too much. I I, I used to be I used to be a fan of early, early stopping before, but Philip is trying hard to convince me that it is. It is not the thing that, 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 that you need to do. And I guess in the last year, I haven't used it. But before that, yeah, it was it was my way to go both for, for, for the classic machine learning and, and, and deep learning use cases. But currently, yeah, I, I'm, I'm turning to, 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 uh, to the dark sides. <laughs> Does anyone I mean, use early stopping it? I mean, just as Philip said, I, I sometimes use it to get some very, very quick results with like GBM or other boosting methods. So this is probably the only time that I ever use early stopping. And other than that, I just feel it, it's uh, leaking information from your validation set to the, to the training pipeline. So this is definitely something I would, I would, uh, I would like to avoid at all costs. So I, yeah, just as Philip, I, I never use it. Same for me. Um, basically, run it maybe once, twice, whenever you change the parameters a lot, just to understand what's approximately the optimal number of estimators for LightGBM or number of epochs. And then that's basically become that becomes a hyperparameter to tune. Yeah, same. So in the beginning of the competition, so to have a quick, quick baseline, I usually use it. But uh, after a while, um, when I have more time to um, for long running experiments, then it's safer to uh, change to fix epochs uh, for all models. And 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 maybe if I if I can, I, I think someone on this group uh, posted it a while ago that there was someone on Twitter saying you wouldn't tune any other hyperparameter differently across different folds. And I think this is quite a good analogy why you wouldn't tune something that is different per fold. And early stopping usually can be very different per fold. So you would sometimes stop at the third epoch, fifth epoch. And there is another big benefit of not doing it, which I think is a different topic to talk about, which is retraining on the full data. But if you don't do it, it, it it's also easier, easier to do that. Okay, I, I was expecting some, some some form of fight, but maybe maybe I'll keep. Maybe we'll have a GM fight in this panel. Uh, but early stopping is a no for everyone. Thanks for that. Um, the next question is: There's also the strong debate, especially uh, for people from FastA group. They really like the learning rate scheduler that FastA offers. Do you have a strong opinion there? Do you prefer just the cosine learning rate, or what's what's your preference? Sir? And what is uh, what is your favorite scheduler at FastAI Group? What There's an inbuilt one. Uh, I, I don't remember what, what the details okay. are, but you just call LR.fit and uh, it uses one implemented by Leslie Smith. OK. Yeah, for, for, for me, I guess, I guess I'm always using just Cassian scheduler. So it is their uh, first and probably the only option I'm trying. Previously, when, when I was a fan of, of early stopping, I was also using it with with a warm restarts, right? So it means that you're mm -hmm. you're doing one cycle, then you're making another one, and then you're kind of you can average maybe multiple uh, checkpoints or select the best one. Uh, but yeah, but currently I, I don't I don't even try other other schedulers. I guess it, it's it's a moment. And sorry, just just for the audience, what I was doing right now was I was uh, screen sharing to Hydrogen Torch and uh, just walking through the different settings there, and showing the different uh, schedulers in there. Does anyone else uh, want to share <laughs> what they use as a baseline? Uh, I mean, I, we, I also always use Cosine DK only, either with a short warm up or not. And I think this also fits very well to the to the discussion with early stopping, because if you try that the last epoch is the best one, you try to get a, a nice a nice DK on the learning rate and and try to be uh, uh, decaying to, towards the end. Um, and also a couple of years ago when I started with deep learning and it was a bit more popular back then is to do stuff like um, uh, automatic decaying of the learning rate on a plateau or something, right? So you run one epoch, 
you see, okay, it doesn't improve for one or two epochs, you automatically reduce it. Um, but all of this is very overfitted to the validation data set. You cannot properly do it for training on the full data. So I think, I think in the end, actually, um, I'm, or most of us, I believe, are, are using cause in decay. Uh, uh, um, linear decay works pretty much the same, but just some, some, some steady decay towards, towards the, the end of the epochs. I assume Philip sort of shared it for you. Pascal, please go ahead. Yeah, I think it even fits a little bit to the previous uh, question, because with higher learning rate, um, some more shaky metrics um, tend to um, go up and down quite a lot between each epoch. So you may run into some, some local optimum, but it's just very, very specific to your validation data, and it never would, uh, would yeah, um, be, be able to, to do the same um, performance on any, any unseen data. So I think having a very low learning rate at the end makes most sense in these, um, for these cases. But I also think that there are some uh, use cases where cosine may not be ideal, and that would be like training super large language models um, on, on a huge amount of, um, of, G of GPUs or TPUs. And in these cases, um, yeah, I also see that that uh, very constant uh, learning rate um, can be beneficial, but this is actually a super low learning rate in this case. I was just so uh, showing how the cosine learning rate behaves in this graph. Yeah, and this so is basically for, for fine tuning, this is uh, mostly the way to go. Um, there's a question by Crowdog. I'm sure you all know who he is. Shout out to Crowdog. He's asking, do you use stochastic, uh, stochastic weight, weighted averaging? Is it weight averaging, weighted averaging? Probably no. <laughs> <Just Okay>. answer. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess I could, I could have tried it a couple of times, but it, it never worked for me. As in just, uh, selection is the last best checkpoint. So yeah, so, and it, again, it, it aligns with this idea, right? That we are just taking, we're, we're trying to get the best performance in the last epoch without early stopping. And yeah, so you, you usually it works better for me. Okay, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I think on Kaggle, there is sometimes uh, the, the flavor of the month, right? So some obscure technique works in some competition <laughs> and suddenly everyone thinks this is like the best thing to use across all competitions. And I think, Stochastic weight averaging was used somewhere and then people like to try it again, specifically in NLP. There is a lot of different techniques out there in order to try to regularize the training a bit better. But in the end, those are all just techniques to regularize. And usually from my experience, you can just use simpler methods and it works equally well and you don't have extra runtime. So there is a lot of stuff very specifically tailored towards some tasks and, 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 and yeah, just because it works for someone doesn't mean it will always work. And at the same time, it doesn't mean there is not something simpler that will have the same effect and also work. So sometimes I try it when I see something new popping up, but um, usually I, I feel like there's a lot of, lot of noise in these te techniques out there and, and, and you don't need to use all of them. Thanks, thanks, Philip. Um, the next question I had was, uh, can you please share your best practices? You sort of pointed towards it, but for warm-up epochs. And if I show the default settings, it, it does show your, everyone's uh, preference towards cosine because that's always the default option uh, in the menu for hydrogen torch. But best practices for warming up the learning rate. No one wants to share. Yeah, I, I, I can start. Uh, so basically, for, for, for me, warm up uh, works sometime, yes, sometimes, but uh, the problem is that it is, it is hard, hard to tune. So, so usually, once you, you have a fixed number of epochs, I feel it is kind of counterintuitive to, to like tune it together with number of epochs. And 
uh, also like their peak of the learning rate uh, is different, right? So you, you have to adjust the number of epochs and I can't tune it well. So may, maybe that is why it is not working for me, but sometimes, sometimes it is useful. And I guess in one of the recent NLP competitions, we even used like two epochs and one is one epoch was warm up. So actually it was like one epoch warming up 50% of training. And then 50% of, of training, it was like just uh, going going down on, on the on the cosine schedule. So yeah, so sometimes it is it is helpful. Thanks. Uh, the the hydrogen team hydrogen has won many many competitions together, and I, I can't even remember which one Yawin is referring to because they they medaled in so many competitions together. Um, does anyone have any strong opinions on this? Okay, I, I can keep going in, in order of my questions. Um, the other topic, and I assume this is really from a beginner perspective, because these, these things are heavily discussed throughout different courses and stuff like that. Um, but any strong opinions on optimizers you'd like to use while training? Adam, Adam is enough. <laughs> Let's just use Adam. Adam W and you're good. Is my opinion. Anyone else have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think again, it, it depends on, on on your intuition, right? So if uh, you used to work with with SGD, for example, right, and you know they are like best schedulers and best learning rates that are working for for this optimizer, it might be better for you to use to continue uh, continue using the SGD. But yeah, but I guess the way to go is Adam W now every, everywhere again only for for fine tuning tasks, right? So mostly we're talking here about fine tuning tasks, and I think it is it is the best best choice here. Yeah, at least it makes it very very easy to to get some initial good results. Um, I mean, it doesn't um, or it allows you to to. Uh, yeah, set a large range of, of learning rates and it would still work on, on most uh, backbones at least, uh, which is not the case for SGD. So it needs to be tuned a lot better to, or not a lot more to, to get the same results probably. And again, I was pointing out that <laughs> I'm sort of trying to reverse engineer how Hydrogen Torch was built, but uh, the default again was IMW, and you can see the opinions here as well from the panel. Uh, but these are the general options. And the next question I have is really visible here. Many people talk about differential learning rates. So what I'm trying to solve here is a segmentation problem. Uh, and as you can see, there are many different problems supported. I just chose this as an example. But uh, any thoughts on differential learning rate? And for the audience, this is the act of applying uh, different learning rates to different layers because you assume that the initial layers have, are already trained, the outer layers are less trained. So differential learning rates is the question. Yeah, I, I can answer it again. Uh, so, so I think differential learning rate is an easy technique that can be very helpful. Um, specifically for certain tasks. So basically it means that you give different types of learning rates to different parts of the network. And usually usually the easiest difference is that you give the backbone a different learning rate and the head, for example, a different learning rate or the encoder and decoder in this case. Um, and um, uh, different to what many people think, a higher learning rate usually means less overfitting. Um, so you, because it cannot make too fine grained jumps uh, in, 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 in to, to go into a very specific overfitting area. And basically what usually works well is to give the head of the network um, a, a, the, the, a higher learning rate. And sometimes it is even, even easier doing this from the start because switching the backbones is easier because um, backbones sometimes need very different uh, learning rates. So let's say you use an efficient net versus a, versus a transformer-based backbone model. Then you can just keep the head uh, learning rate constant and just change the learning rate of the backbone. And it, it sometimes make it, make, makes it easier to, to, to try different backbones. 
And as I said, the regularizations of some problem types even needed. So in metric learning, it is super important in things like semantic segmentation here, it can be very important. And sometimes it is really, really necessary and sometimes more a, a, a tuning thing. But yeah, a, a good technique to, to play with. Thanks for sharing that, Philip. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Gabor if he has anything to add. Haven't used it yet, so. Okay. Usually I try to keep it simple, especially mm, even, even the learning rate. So I'm not a good example for finding the best models. So whenever I have time, and I mean, we have enough inference time for Kaggle competition. Usually I go with a blend of army of weaker models. So not necessarily the stronger ones. It doesn't uh, necessarily a successful technique, but it usually helps uh, to build a more stable model. But of course it would be insane to put into in production. So it only works for CSV like uh, Kaggle competitions or smaller data sets where you have uh, enough uh, inference time. Thanks. Thanks, Gabor. Um, Pascal, I saw you unmuting if you still have to. Yeah, I mean, differential learning rate uh, usually also helps in the in the beginning of a training. Uh, so similar to to um, yeah that form up um, we mentioned. Um, so if you have a very biased um, target, for example, you would uh, probably give the head a higher learning rate, and uh, then it adapts quickly without uh, putting too much gradients on the on the backbone uh, in the, within the first steps. And also, um, yeah, what what has come with the with the rise of the transformer models, they usually need a very very uh, small learning rate to work well. And um, if you still want a, a larger head, for example, with uh, a two layer dense or uh, two dense layers or something like this, um, you you may want to have an order of magnitude higher learning rate there. Thanks, Pascal. Um, awesome. Uh, so while I was trying to showcase different things, uh, one thing I really enjoy about the fact of using hydrogen torch every day at work, I, I get to use this just for experiments, is the fact that even to implement differential learning, it's like I could mess up in so many ways. One time I'd set a global name for LR. And that was messing up differential learning rates. But here, everything is taken care of. And I can just select all of these options. There are also very fine things taken care of. So if you want to like not painfully experience the last batch giving a weird error after two days of training, this setting is already taken care of. So usually the last batch is always dropped uh, without too much thinking. Um, so while I keep... Uh, weaving in and out of that, I would like to also shift the conversation to it's now computer vision specific models. Um, I know people also have very strong opinions on data augmentation, and maybe I can start a fight with this, but uh, your opinions on favorite data augmentations for computer vision problems. Yeah, mostly, mostly try everything that you can think of <laughs> and check your score, I would say. I mean, yeah, you, you can't have favorite augmentations because these are just super specific to the to the actual problem you're trying to solve. Um, and in some cases, uh, augmentations um, don't make sense at all from a from a physical standpoint. In some cases, they make uh, in, in some cases they make perfect sense, but they still don't yield better results. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a, a matter of trying out um, anything that you can come up with. And as you just shown in in hydrogen, we have a, a couple of predefined settings there, but you can also yeah go ahead and customize anything. Yeah, usually, usually I'm creating kind of a simple, simple notebook with your like augmentations pip pipeline for each each problem, and you're trying to kind of generate a couple of examples of say images from the data set, and apply it to the probabilities you want to adjust. And usually I'm just uh, clicking ten times to see what what are the different images I'm getting, augmented images I'm getting from the original image, and usually it gives you an idea what it, what what is the best set of augmentations for your specific problem type or. or uh, how, uh, how would you like it to, to, to have at least from, from your point of view? And, at, uh, and on top of it, all this mix augmentations, right? So in hydrogen, you have cut mix and, and mix up. 
So yes, yeah, so for example, here is an example of, of cut mix where we are pasting one image on, uh, into, into another with different parts. And this, this mix augmentations are really working well for almost all the tasks, I would say. So sometimes it is mix up, sometimes it is cut mix, but at least one of them is, is usually working. Yeah, also um, my personal experience, I, I, I tend not to have uh, some sort of um, insights or guts feeling what's gonna work uh, this time, what's not gonna work. So it's uh, all trial and errors, except for some cases when like obviously flipping would work or obviously flipping would ruin things. So it's the matter for me to, of iterating. So starting with something simple, uh, either no augmentations or something that would obviously work and then try uh, try things that would add value. Uh, and typically most interesting ones are exactly uh, the, uh, the strange ones like uh, cutouts, uh, cut mix, mix ups, uh, all the uh, augmentations that do something with, the, with an image, which is for me very difficult to predict whether it will help uh, the model or not. So just a matter of trying, preferably one by one and try to, to grasp kind of uh, the feeling what works uh, and what combinations of augmentations work. Between the panel, uh, Dimitri and Philip's team had won a competition that actually was, and their model was used in real world in uh, NFL. I, I might mess up the details, but it was actually impactful in the real world. And Yahoo is widely known as one of the best in uh, computer vision competitions. So I was, I was curious to extract details from them. Um, Moving on to the next one, um, people heavily also debate the backbones and um, architectures for segmentation. So do you just use unit, unit plus plus, or is it also specific to the problem in your opinion? I can I, I can start. So yeah, so so usually I'm um, for segmentation, I'm using like unit and unit plus plus, and I guess I'm already like far behind the current state of the art. So probably there are lots of different new architectures, but for the majority of their semantic segmentation use cases, especially if you have a low number of classes, like under 10 classes, for example, or under a dozen of class classes, uh, UNET is, is working nicely out of the box. And the advantage here, for example, in Hydrogen Torch that we have also selection of backbones, right? So apart from having just this UNET architecture, you can select almost any backbone in, uh, in team from team library and it allows you to also squeeze far more performance, even using this kind of like old school uh, unit, unit architecture. Yeah, I mean, let me put you on the spot. I've never heard of RegNets. Have you ever used this in a competition? <laughs> this Reg is the first time I heard this model. Could you scroll down? Oh, uh, RegNets. Uh, actually, I have, I have uh, like read a paper during our last competition. I guess it was D DFL competition, like this Bundesliga competition in September. And I've read the paper and their idea, I guess, of the paper was that it is very shallow networks that works that work works much faster than efficient nets. But and it produced pretty solid results, I guess. We we, we got a pretty good baseline with, with RegNet. But uh, after like in the end of the competition, efficient net v2 was was the winner. So it was it was good, but not not as good enough, I think. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I think for both for both uh, what, what, what Johan said for semantic segmentation, object detection, and so on, I think the interesting aspect that you can try when 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 training models is to is to try different backbones and um, and a lot of the more popular frameworks I would say are very limited in the choice of of of, of backbones. So let's let's take object detection. You have YOLO with like a very limited, very shallow backbones. You have uh, efficient debt, which only has efficient nets, obviously as backbones. Um, and 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 what what we did in the past, and what we also have here in hydrogen, is that you actually can 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 select like all the team or most of the team backbones. Um, for example, for for object detection, for RCNN based and or FCOS based uh, 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 techniques. And also for semantic segmentation. Um, so I think there is really a lot of lot of room to 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 tune this kind of uh, two stage approaches with different backbones. And 
Um, yeah, so 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 I think that 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 is valuable, and there is, from my experience, not a lot of pre-built frameworks that can do that easily. So I think that that's that's where we have a, a lot of cool stuff, specifically in hydrogen, also. And in the meantime, what I did was just just to compare different backbones and different architectures. I also ran a grid search, and that's also possible just through the menu as I was showcasing. Okay, uh, I was sorry, I got distracted looking at the questions. And for, for the audience, please keep the questions coming. I, I am looking at them as, as you saw me distracted. I'll ask them towards the end. So if, if you're watching live, please keep asking the questions in the chat. Um, shifting the conversation again towards NLP, uh, any strong opinions on data augmentations in NLP that you really enjoy or you're really against? Usually, when I'm starting an NLP competition, I'm always excited that yes, this time I'll try some fancy augmentations and they will work for me. But it is either they don't don't work at all, or I don't have time to to try it, and it is <laughs> in the very end of the priority list. So usually, it is my experience. But but yeah, I, I'm really excited about this like back translation augmentation, right? That you translate to one language and translate back. I have never tried it, but it looks like something that that, that might work. And the only things that worked for me was their masking augmentation, right? Where we are just like randomly masking their uh, tokens. So it's just just, just as, as a classic augmentation. It's, 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 it's the only ones that worked for me before. Yeah, same here, probably. So the only thing that actually really got a got a boost in in any competitions that I took place in was dropping either um, single tokens or words or even complete sentences or larger blocks of, of tokens. So this is kind of the, the thing that uh, usually works. Um, but there is yeah this other technique like MLM pre-training pre that you can do, which kind of achieves a similar thing, I would say. Um, but it's even usable on a, on a data set, on an unseen data set, an un unlabeled data set. Um, so yeah, with with regard to augmentations, it's uh, usually just the dropout and uh, other techniques uh, such as yeah replacing words with similar words or um, this this translation into another language and back translation uh, never really got me any boost. So it's usually just the same score, but it takes a lot longer to train. <laughs> Is yeah, it also that, because... that, that, so, sorry, please, please. No, I, I just wanted to say that's that's one of the reasons why I like tuning computer vision models more because NLP is very boring to tune because there's like no <laughs> augmentation at work. Is is I haven't seen any single augmentation at works apart from yeah masking tokens. Um, because the the, the 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 models are way stronger pre-trained than computer vision models, so they have a way better understanding of of different different settings. Uh, is, is at least w w what I see. And um, yeah, so so I, I haven't seen seen anything useful. And of course, here or there is something maybe, right? But definitely not, nothing that you could say is as popular as mix up or cut mix or uh, uh, simple things like flipping even are useless, right? So um, yeah, it, it's definitely, definitely uh, an unfortunate lack in NLP or maybe a fortunate, I don't know, um, that that, there, that augmentations are not working so well. Actually, now that you're saying mix-up is not working, so um, if you have a very, very specific problem where you could exchange sentences with each other, with each other from another batch or even another, another sample, that does work in some cases, but it's it's as you said, there is um, not much to gain from because these these uh, models tend to be uh, very very good already pre-trained. So that's also the the point why you why you usually need only a couple of epochs in NLP versus uh, quite a few epochs in in CV competitions. Yeah, I, I have tried cut mix based uh, uh, mixing. Uh, I have tried mix up of the embeddings, right? That is one technique you can do. Um, but nothing really has ever helped me. So, so uh, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but, but uh, uh, 
even if it if it if it makes sense and this matches what Dimitri said before, sometimes sometimes I even try to think, okay, this augmentation has to make sense, right? And when you train a model, it doesn't make any sense any longer, or it doesn't help. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I I hope there will be something that that is as popular as Mixup, but um, for now I I don't see it. Or you can also tune the batch size <laughs> if you're training <laughs> transformer yeah. models. They're super sensitive to that. Yeah, I mean there are way way more low hanging fruits specific fruits in, in, in specifically in NLP to tune. It, it's a bit more sensitive to learning rate than computer vision models because it's transformer based. It's more sensitive to epochs and so on. So I, I think I think there there is more room versus playing with any fancy augmentation that you can think of. Specifically in given limited time uh, scenarios. Awesome. Uh, I'll I'll continue in my questions list. So uh, what I've done next is I've loaded up the last feedback competition where Philip I think competed solo because Yawen was on leave. <laughs> um, and as you can see, it also supports text regression problem among everything else. But um, the topic I was coming to was I know Philip, you you said you have a strong preference towards gem pooling, but again, is is this also something you all experiment with, or any opinions on pooling layers you like to have in your backbones? Yeah, I I usually use always gem. Um, it's a bit of a lazy version because it's kind of an automatic blend of max and average pooling in in a way. Um, in NLP, I will try class pooling for sure. Um, because it's the most different one um, uh, to to the gem, and but but usually I, I actually <laughs> have a strong preference towards gem pooling nowadays, um, and 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 mostly use that as a default. But I don't think it's too important, honestly. I think with average pooling, you can it, it's pretty much the same. Um, also class pooling, it's class pooling is maybe the most different one, I would say, but in general, uh, pooling, I don't think is the most important thing to, to, to tune. And so, sometimes for NLP, maybe it depends a bit on the, on the problem, right? So if you'd like to have a global context from the, from the whole sequence, you might get, you might, you might want average pooling across all the tokens, but if you're like interested in the, like just C, the CLS token for classification, like sentiment analysis, whatever, some some simple classification, it might be better to use CLS token. But yeah, but usually it is not 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 a much of a difference. There. I mean, maybe I can I can I can uh, relax that, that that statement by us a little bit because there is some room to be innovative with pooling. I think in in NLP, specifically if you have like longer text and you need to have at certain parts of the text maybe maybe some pooling so in the in the second feedback competition that was like that where you have like different statements inside a long text and you need to make uh, a prediction for like all of these statements then you would pick out certain parts of the whole 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 text and just take the poolings at different points so so stuff like that i think there is room for innovation but in the fundamental functionality of the pooling not um I see some people doing the pooling across like different layers and so on. Um, and they spend weeks on just trying to tune that. I think all of this is, is, is not too useful uh, uh, most of the time. Um, and there, there are other things which, which uh, you, you better spend time on. It's also sometimes confusing when you read top solutions. It it appears that maybe the pooling layer was like a big factor, but sometimes sometimes competitors aren't telling the secrets. Uh, fortunately, many of the people here on the panel usually end up open sourcing their solutions. So you might might find uh, most of the times I found Team Hydrogen. You can find their code and it's very easy to digest. I've also asked them during the interviews, why do you do that? But they like sharing a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll start moving into audience questions and some general questions now on. Um, the I'll try to summarize Santosh's question, but uh, do you usually average your models across uh, your predictions across different folds or do you end up retraining your uh, model, your best fold model and any best practices you can share along that? Yeah, this, this is definitely something that, that uh, we, we do. Um most of the time is to just uh, to, to not ensemble uh, k-fold models 
um, for final prediction, but rather different seats um, on retrained on the full full data. So um, deep learning has a very big impact in terms of the amounts of training data, and usually more data is better. And with Kfold, you usually throw away, let's say, 20% of the data. Sure, it can be sometimes valuable to ensemble different subsets of the data with each other. So there are definitely some use cases where, where this is helpful. But I think most of the time, um, it's better and more stable to rather retrain the model k times on the full data and ensemble the different um, seeds with each other. And as in the beginning of this, this 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 panel, we discussed like early stopping. If you have like a fixed epoch, you just you can take all the settings the same and just retrain on the full data and use it blindly. And uh, I would say ninety percent of the cases, uh, I at least I at least do this retraining for for the final final submission if if I have time. If I don't have time, I can even mix k fold models with with. Full fit models. Uh, I don't see any issue in that. Um, but you would maybe weight it similarly. So if you have, let's say, three seeds of full fits, you would 50 50 blend this with, uh, with an average of five folds or something like this. Um, but in general, this, this has worked well on, on the private leaderboard mostly. And, and, and this, this approach is also helpful in terms of saving the time, the inference time, right? So if you're on seven, five faults, then you have to run like five inferences on the full data. It is just one single retrain. And it is better to ensemble like five different um, backbones, let's say, for the same runtime instead of like ensembling five, five faults. So it is, it is also helpful for, for ensembling. Yes, and usually, so uh, in, 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 in a, in a um, rough estimate is that Three seats full train is roughly usually equalish to 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 five fold uh, uh, blend. I would say roughly. Yeah, and, and it was it was very counterintuitive for me. So I guess I remember we discussed with Philip, and again I was using like five folds back then, not the full full data retrain. And it was really like counterintuitive that it it has a similar performance as ensembling of five folds because from my point of view it was that if you are like ensembling five folds, it should be better than a single model at least more, more stable. But yeah, but it occurs that it is not not actually true, or partly not true. Yeah, but sometimes the out of world predictions might help for a problem. So I can only imagine uh, competitions where there was a strong uh, image component and also some strong tabular or time series like component and uh, two stage models training different uh, CV models and different uh, tabular like models like like GBM and then uh, building uh, a meta model to combine the predictions those are the cases where it could have if it's not easy to encode the um, information into the CV model yes 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 but what works from experience is that you can do these Second, you, you mean like second stage models, right? Or stacker models or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, usually it works well, or at least it worked fast to train the stacker models on OOF and just apply them to the to the full fits. So that even works most of the time. Yep, yeah. I'm, I'm just too cautious to run a blind uh, model with, with every stage, but yeah, with, with good and stable training pipeline, it could work, but uh, yeah. I, I, in I, those, I, those I, cases, I prefer to see the validation score at uh, each each of my local CV. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, even even training the stacker models on in sample predictions mostly works. So you can even do this with 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 the full fit in sample predictions. But yeah, doing it on OOF and then predicting on full mm -hmm. fit is usually good enough. But yeah, I, I see your I see your point. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And uh, just just to point out to the audience, like personally, I'm really enjoying this because uh, I am sure you all know, but uh, Team Hydrogen, for example, there's the special track in uh, the feedback competitions where there's efficiency track and you're supposed to like, do the inference in the fastest time possible and it has to be the most accurate. And they've, they've performed really well in those tracks as well. So like, it's, it's we're really getting access to all of this knowledge uh, and just to point different facts out.
someone had asked uh, if you could please share your favorite uh, debugging strategy yeah i i, I remember that, that i guess it was some kind of like uh, article saying that it is a good approach to uh, take a small sample of data and then overfeed to this data and make sure that your pipeline works. And if it, if you manage to overfeed even, even on the small data. And I tried to like, back in the early days, I tried to follow this, right? To, to debug your like deploying pipeline, not, not even going into the code, right? But just the general architectures that everything works end to end. And it, it never worked for me. So, so I didn't manage to, to overfeed to this uh, small data. And afterwards I realized that yes, probably it is better to just uh, throw in the real data and try and, and see if it works or not, right? And afterwards, if you see that something is not working, the best the best way is just to uh, go through your pipeline, right? And debug it in a way that you see what, what was the input in this step and, and what was the output of this step and is it expected? Uh, the, the, do the images look, look fine? Do, their, the, the, do, 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 do the outputs of their sizes look fine and so on and so forth? So then it's just a basic debugging as an usual uh, software code. I mean, other than that, it's usually the the shapes that are um, that are in the wrong order, or something like this. So um, yeah, just just adding some print commands and asserts um, in the forward already helps quite a lot in the early stages uh, to make sure that you you don't mix up, for example, the, your um, yeah, your width and your height, um, just because some augmentation was uh, was flipping this. Uh, so these are definitely some some things uh, that uh, I usually do in the in the early stages. Um, yeah, also uh, regarding width and height, uh, making sure you don't use the same value for both um, helps a lot <laughs> to to think uh, this through and to to not um, yeah miss miss uh, a flip there. I debug by printing everything in every line and sometimes they don't even get printed. So that's my favorite strategy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I mean, my, my colleagues know that I, I, I do a lot of prints and I always forget to remove them in my uh, pull requests. So um, <laughs> they, they have to notify me about that. But in general, I'm also lazy in that sense. I, I, I find it the easiest still to do print commands. And I think there's another big thing to debugging, which is logging in deep learning. And I think this is even more important um, than, than the, so if you do all the logging, like what we saw in, in, in what, what you showed before with like, what is your current learning rate? What is your current uh, validation loss, training loss? It is very easy to also find problems, right? So if you implement the COSIN decay learning rate scheduler and it and, and your logging shows a constant one, you know that you have a bug. And mm -hmm. otherwise, it is oftentimes very, very hard to, to figure out this bug. Or actually, if you go back to these train data insights, uh, if, if you implement a new, a new uh, augmentation technique and you directly visualize your first batch like we are doing here, and you see, okay, the augmentation is not working as it should be. It's very quick to, 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 to find these issues. And I think that has been very important in, in the general pipeline that we built uh, in order to do a lot of logging and a lot of automatic visualizations and, and, and things like that, uh, which, which because oftentimes you miss a bug because it's not throwing an error, right? But it is not doing what it should be. So, and, and, and that makes it easier to find these issues. Thanks, Philip. Um, just looking at the chat, and uh, also I was I was teasing my teammate. I said it's someone is he's my teammate, an absolutely incredible Kagler. Uh, I was just teasing him. Um, he's asking how do you optimize uh, hyperparameters of large models, and if if you have any any opinions on that, especially for complex architectures in LP where they're very easy to overfit, especially the larger back, uh, larger models. Yeah, I mean, similar to to all the problem types, you usually start up with a small with a smaller subset um, of of training data, so it doesn't take ages to to find the to, to find the issues. 
um, and then you would start also not with the largest backbone. So if you have Diverta, for example, as a backbone for for NLP problems, uh, you wouldn't start off with the largest there is available, but probably a base one, and then start iterating from there and and finding uh, a sweet spot where you are and uh, what is a reasonable score to get on this data. And once once you have that and got a bit of a feeling to to all the hyperparameters, you can always go to the higher um, to the larger backbones to um, to more data and all of this. Uh, so I think it's always always important to not uh, use the best or the largest model out there, and also not your full data if it's a, a lot of data. Uh, so you can iterate quickly and get get some some uh, huge jumps in your in your metric uh, quickly. Thanks, Pascal. Um, I don't see anyone else unmuting. I'll I'll keep keep asking the next questions. Uh, there's also a usual preference, like you were pointing out, and uh, this was actually discussed in one of our internal calls just, just a few days ago. People, especially novices, usually go for the largest model possible. Uh, and in computer vision, or like generally, when do you prefer simpler models over transformer models? Or is, is there any time you prefer, let's say, efficient nets uh, over other, other transformer models? I, I will always prefer the one that works the best, right? So um, that that that's the simple answer. I will try everything. You you have a preference. You start with something, and then you experiment and you experiment and and you go down 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 the rabbit hole. And and either you find something better or, or you don't. If a efficient P zero works better than a P three, I will prefer maybe the P zero, right? Um, so it's an experimental science. You try out things, and 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 some things work better. Some things uh, some things work here better. Some things work there better. But in general, I would say efficient nets in computer vision are kind of across problems usually the best working and the easiest to tune from, from experience. And and in NLP, it's nowadays the Berta that is is clearly working the best. So you have some preference, but you will try other things. Um, Yeah, and probably in, in each in each new competition, it is better to uh, not to have any assumptions, right? That this architecture will, will work better. So it is always better to to check all the architectures and select the best one for this specific data set for this specific competition. So assumptions are usually wrong. <laughs> yes, and also don't don't believe everything that is written on the forums. If someone says this is the best for for this. Take it with a grain of salt, try it, but it doesn't need to be the best one for, for you. Um, so there is always, always better to try things yourself. So the top public team saying mobile net is best are lying. <laughs> yeah, you can you can you can you, you can believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Um but but I have I have I have fallen myself in, into this trap, right? So you you join a competition late. There is a lot of discussion. There is maybe even a high scoring public kernel, which maybe was lucky, right? And you try to replicate this, and you try and you try and you try and you and you try and you can't. And at some point, you 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 don't understand why why is it not possible to replicate it? People write it is good. But sometimes there are so many different things coming together and it could be something else that they are doing which impacts the results and not necessarily the backbone or not necessarily what, what, what they think it, 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 it is impacting. So it's always better to, to, to try things yourself and also go different directions than what the majority is doing. Thanks, Philip. Um, anyone else want to chime in on this? Okay, I'll I'll take the next audience question, which is, uh, if you could share any best practices for training models on uh, large image sizes with class imbalance, or if if I can rephrase that, uh, best practices for class imbalances. Yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I, you, I, I guess I guess I can rephrase it. What, what, what is the best strategy for our snake competition, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would have understood that question even without the next comment, which, which is hello from RSNA competition. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's typically on Kaggle that you have large data, right? Um, 
I, I don't think there is anything specific. So just browse through the old competitions and 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 try things. Uh, uh, we, we not 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 saying too much on this. <laughs> you had to ask that question more smartly. <laughs> Sorry, we can't do private sharing here or public sharing, so to speak. Yeah, but um, um, but, but usually there is there like a good dependency between the image size and, and the performance of the model, right? So they're larger, so, so at, at least to some extent, the larger the image size, the better there's the performance. Uh, yeah, so this is this is a good strategy to start with some smaller images and then, then increase the sizes afterwards. Thanks, Yavin. Um As a reminder to the audience, we have five more minutes. So if you have any questions, please keep them coming. I'll, I'll keep selecting them. Uh, the next question I'd ask is uh, if you could share any best practices for stacking or uh, second stage models. And we had somewhat discussed this, but if you could share more more secrets, maybe you can maybe I can help the person in RSA and virus. Gabor, maybe I can ask you. It, it depends. So sometimes you need a first stage image detection model just to select different layers, or if you are talking about large images, you could select the region of interest in uh, in those images. But there are a few years back, each and every uh, Kaggle uh, winner submission had a huge, crazy uh, stacking model with two or three stages. But I don't think it's common anymore. So I'm not, not that active, but uh, what I, I see nowadays is, is a single model or single like ar architecture could uh, compete with, with the crazier ensembles nowadays. Thanks, Gabriel. Depends on the problem, of course. So, yeah, I have quite, quite quite the same experience. Like back in the days, it was very uh, fancy to have like two, three stage models and throw in five, 10 different uh, modeling techniques into the first stage, a few more in the second stage and so forth. But uh, these days, even for tabular competitions, it's, it's more typical to see two maximum three different approaches. So for stacking, you just usually do something very simple like weighted average and that works the best already. I, 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 think, I think second stage models can be helpful uh if the metric is very different to what you can train on basically so usually you then you need to do either some post-processing let's say aggregate the scores of different subsamples of a person or or of a, of a record you have uh, but here second stage models can make sense to build this in a better way and to directly optimize the metric on a level that you are interested in but yeah, the, these crazy stacker models, I'm personally not a fan because they are also can be very overfitty and not so efficient. Specific, specifically in deep learning, it's basically not, 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 not happening too, too much. But more shallow second stage models, I am, I am starting to be more a fan of versus I have been in the past. I think they can be helpful and they have been useful in, the, in, the, in some previous competitions of ours. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start wrapping up. If there's one last question, I'll try to squeeze it in. So one last call for everyone. In the meantime, I was showcasing as a reminder, hydrogen toss to everyone. And I, I did prove the point that uh, you can train really high accuracy models. And this is, I think a personal record for me. I've trained about like the highest number of very accurate models in like under an hour, which is like a personal record for me, as you can see. But it's really easy to prototype in all of these experiments, as you can uh, literally see here. If you want to check this out, you can see the first link uh, in the description. I'll also pin it as a comment if you want to check out the software or evaluate it for yourself. And I also established that all of these opinions were also baked into the product. So um, I don't see any question, any final words for anyone before we wrap up. If I missed anything, or if there's anything else you want to share, I'll I'll, I'll try to squeeze one question from Alex because he he's always a regular to our, our events. He's he's saying neural network tips for tabular data. If anyone has any opinions on that, 
For me, nothing that would always work. So depending on the tabular data you have, um, I usually spend a lot of time um, trying to convert the variables to for the neural network to consume it properly, or uh, even more typical nowadays, the, the, the tabular data is not just tabular data. So there's some structure which we can have uh, starting from uh, kind of time dependency, ending with some uh, graph-like connections between the records that you can squeeze in specific uh, types of layers of the neural network and can benefit from that. Uh, so apart from that, um, nothing that I would say always works. Thanks, Dimitri. But it shouldn't discourage you from trying. Uh, so, so there is not an easy solution like GBMs in, in neural networks, but I think there is still potential for some, for some problems to be better solvable with, with neural networks. So sometimes they can work, um, as, as Dimitri said. But even if they don't reach the same performance as like GBM, you just blend it and so very, very often it improves the overall score. Just taking a simple average, uh, you get a nice boost. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I'll, I'll wrap up now. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, uh, this is an absolute legendary panel. I, I don't know if you don't know anyone. I, I, I feel bad for you because you should. And in case you don't, and in case you want to connect with them, just check the description. I put the links to everyone's different profiles on the internet. You can always expect them to be sharing such, such knowledge everywhere on the internet. So you can follow them on Kaggle if you want. You can see all of their Kaggle usernames right now being displayed. Uh, you can connect with Everyone is on LinkedIn and most of them are on Twitter as well. So you can find all of the speakers uh, links in the description of this video. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And also thank you so much uh, to the panel and all of you for really sharing your knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. I'll I'll wrap this up. And as a reminder to the audience, if you if you're watching this as a recap, please leave a comment on the video, and I'll I'll try to get back to your questions. So if if you're watching a recap, if you missed a live stream, we'll answer your questions still. Thanks for watching.